Hey, my name is Pastor Sunil, and welcome to our archive messages. You can join us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. in person, or catch us live online. We hope that you're truly blessed by this message, and once again, thanks for tuning in. We'll move on. Malachi chapter 1. They're going to be finding that and getting my notes up on the screen. If you want to, uh, you could probably, by just my words, a little test and fill out that little handout you got. Oh, they got that there. That's good. It's just the video. But uh, turn to Malachi chapter 1. If you're having a hard time finding that, you just kind of go to the middle, turn right, or start from the right and go all the way left. You'll get her eventually. Um, there's a bunch of M's in the middle. There's like Malachi, Matthew, Mark. And so... But uh, this is a significant book. Um, I want to give it a couple of background, reminder backgrounds that we kind of did from last week. Uh, but before I do that, here's what's really significant. Um, no, maybe I'll do the last week's background, and then we'll, I'll do one little more comment on the background. Uh, you remember that God's people had, um, had been in exile. In other words, had been chased out by an enemy out of their own land, and uh, they were spread out all over the place out of persecution. And, but since then, some time had passed. God had restored them back. They cried out to God, and God, God started restoring them. After And oftentimes, right, when things get tough is when we cry out to God. But he's always faithful. We cry out to him, and things get back on track again. And so things started getting back on track, and, 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 and the temple got rebuilt at 516 B.C. Things are starting to look a little bit better. Some people started, once things started to look a little bit better, some people started to come back. There was like three waves of people returning. So there's a rebuilding, a returning, a restoring of things that were back to the way they should be. Things started to look more right. The walls started to be built. People feeling a little more secure. And that kind of presented the problem because they started to get complacent. They started to kind of rely not on God as much as starting to believe that we're pretty good. They started to get complacent spiritually and morally resulted in decay they had some fragile peace agreements, but things, things were better, but things weren't as good as they used to be. And so that was presenting some problems. This is a significant book. If you think about it, the difference in the gap, I mean, it is just a, a difference of that in your Bible. But to go from Malachi to Matthew is like hundreds and hundreds of years when you do that. I mean, in our, in our Bible, it's just... It's just a page, the end of Malachi to Matthew, but there's a dark, dark time between these two Testaments where the Bible says that, that God had, had stopped speaking to his people, and that is a dark, dark place. You know, when you are being guided all along, and all of a sudden, someone stops guiding you, and you're on your own, you often feel like this is a difficult time. Now, the thing is, there are still people that were serving him and following him. And, and even John the Baptist's ministry happened before Christ returned. It's incredible that he had that passion and zeal for God. Even after this long, dark time. But just before this long, dark time, it's interesting when we have this book that tells us. You almost see things going downhill. And in the moment of this dark moment in God's people, things were going okay. And I don't have my chair here. We took it away. I should have brought it up again. But you remember the big chair that had your kind of dad's chair? Because we're going to refer to that a couple times again this morning. You know, the chair that dad has, you get up in the chair and says, come here. And you get up in his lap and he says to you, you know, you know, daddy loves you. That type of, last week we learned about that, that they got up in the chair. God's people were called by the father and said, you know, come here. You know, I've always loved you. Situation in Malachi is addressing, you know, there's Jews have returned from after living for many years in modern day Iraq. And things aren't quite as easy. I mean, things seemed okay, but things weren't okay. Things seemed good, but, but on the inside, there was a cancer of complacency eating away at their commitment to God. Malachi comes on scene and challenges them and challenges us. And here's what it is. It's a challenge for today. I'm going to say it a few times. Give God your best. Give him your best. Now, this is an interesting book. It's a dialogue, which makes it actually 
for, for good reading. And if I can say, I was going to say this later, but if I can say, if I can just challenge only four chapters, uh, read it. Just every week. Just sit down. It reads like a story. I mean, it reads very easy. It's, a, it's just a dialogue, and, and so you can read it very easily. But each time we focus on one week, it'll help you understand the book as a whole as you read it. So if I, I can encourage you, if you want to, it's just four chapters, sit down, grab a coffee. Before the coffee gets cold, you'll be almost done. We're listening to this dialogue between God and his people in, in Malachi's unique way of writing. It actually got adopted by, um, by rabbis for years to follow and teach taught in rabbinical schools. This type of, of I'm going to have a claim or a, a, a premise. I'm going to consider possible uh, objections to my premise. And then I'm going to address those objections in my argument. That style. I'm going to make a claim. I know what you're going to say in response to my claim. So I'm going to respond to what I know you're going to respond to when I actually give you my claim. That style. And then usually a summary statement. So we have that uh, happening and it's going to happen again here as we finish in chapter 1 and then head into chapter 2. So here he is, God, in this dialogue. And he says, you know what? I love you. Gets in that chair. Brings them up. And remember, if you remember some of that, that kind of a shocking uh, thing from last week, he calls the children who are kind of straying, rebelling, getting a little bit, a little bit, um, a little bit spoiled. It seems like he calls them up in his lap. He doesn't, he doesn't chastise them, doesn't let them have it. He just tells them, "I've always loved you," and then they they slap him in the face. They say, "How have you loved us?" They question his love. He doesn't. He still doesn't respond in a way that's harsh. But we'll have a responding now. The climbing up in his lap again. So just picture this, these people climbing up in his lap. After he said, I love you, they question his love. He reminds them of his love historically. And then we have this starting at verse 6, Malachi chapter 1. I'm going to read it. You can just, uh, I'm just going to finish uh, the first book of Malachi, even though we're going to head into chapter 2. I'm going to refer to those scriptures later. A son honors, this is the father speaking. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father... Where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is this respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. It is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? Here's a style. You hear how it's happening? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Will he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now plead with God to be gracious to us. Such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the cities, among the nations, for where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden. You sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Quite a text, isn't it? See what I mean? Like, I know, I mean, oftentimes people think like, and I, I was with some pastor friends of mine, uh, we were at a wedding yesterday, and we were sitting at a table together, we got a little family reunion, Bible college reunion, and, and uh, said, do you have to drive all the way home? I said, yeah. So we got in late last night, and I said, you preaching tomorrow? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm preaching tomorrow. I said, what are you preaching on? I said, Malachi. They looked at me like, oh, yeah, because you just can't, you know, pick something easy like loaves and fishes or anything. You got to pick some, oh, Malachi, what do you mean? 
But you can see, this is some good stuff in here. And although, don't get lost, and, and I, I pray I don't lose you in the, I mean, it's hard for us to understand, like, sacrifices, and, and some of this, I think that's why some people, we look at that and we think, ah, oh, you know what, I, it's hard for me to relate to that. And it may be hard, but if we can wade through that a bit, the things behind this are not new. We can all too well identify with what was really going on, what was the problem, and what needed to happen. That part, I promise you, will hit home today. So as much as you might not, I'd be able to identify with this lamb. I, who's, got, who's, got a, who's got a male lamb at home? Like, I don't know how many people, some, maybe one or two, but you know, not many. What are we talking about here? We'll get there. But what you can obviously see, and you notice the cadence of the text. The first one, we didn't get this at all, but all of a sudden, wham, he comes out with this firing machine, the phrase, Lord God Almighty, Lord Almighty. He just, he comes out and says, you know what, is a father not, talks father, and he just says, don't you forget who I am. You ever have one of those moments? I don't know if parents have ever had that. I remember my father one time. Don't you forget you're talking to your mother. I don't know if you've had that one. I never forgot it. I've used the phrase. I mean, we were talking about, I don't know what it was, homework or making my bed or cleaning up my room or taking the garbage out. I don't know what it was. But I remember I had gotten a little bit sassy, big for my britches, as Grandpa would say. And so I got a little bit, you know, sassy. And, and I was speaking, and Dad overheard me giving Mom some lip. And he come around the corner. In a way, reminded me that he was... My father, son, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not even getting my full name. My full name is Jameson David Shepherd. You know you're in trouble when you get Jameson David Shepherd. But didn't even, that took too long for him to say. He wanted this to stop and stop like yesterday. So he's just like, son. And the way he said it, I knew like, oh. <laughs> Sirens were going off. He said, number one, you are talking to your mother. Number two, that's my wife. And how do you think I would, what do you think I would do if anybody was talking, a stranger was talking to her that way? You think I'd let them talk that way? I'd like, no. Well, why should I let you talk her that way? You're my son. I'm your father. And she's my wife. I was like, shoot, yes, sir. My britches just got readjusted to the right size. <laughs> or I got it readjusted to the size of my britches. Here the Father, the Almighty, listen to this. You can see it over and over again. Eleven times in the nine verses. Twenty-three times in the whole book. This phrase, the Lord Almighty. If I'm a master, where is the respect to me? Says the Lord Almighty. Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Will he accept you? Again in verse nine, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 10, am I, not, I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 11, my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 13, you sniff contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 14, for I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty. Then there's a whole bunch again. We go into verse, chapter 2, but I'm saving that for a second. But he, again, when he's reminding us, speaking to the priest more directly, he, the Lord Almighty, the Lord Almighty. Here's where we're going today. This is it. God is an almighty, amazing, great, mighty God. And we should never, ever forget it. And we talk about, oh, what amazing God. We see him doing miracles. But listen, he's not just amazing and mighty when he's doing miracles. He is God, period. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And never steps down from that spot. When we get that out of whack, we get off. That is our true north. And if God is so great, then he deserves our best. That's where we're going today. Living for God can become a ritual rather than a relationship. And when it becomes a ritual, it's evidenced in a genuine lack or, 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 or poor of quality service. We, we just don't, we don't have that same 
zeal, serving him. So when he said, listen, I'm God, don't forget it. Their response is, what? Have you ever had that response? What? You know when the whistle blows in the hockey game and the guy goes, what? What? What do I do? Have you ever had that? Kids, what? What? How come you're looking at me? Have you ever heard that? What's wrong with my service, they say? Well, they were giving sacrifices. It's true. Am I not giving? Am I not going to church? I'm going to the temple. I'm giving. You tell us give. I'm giving. What? See, it's not that that they gave. It's what they gave. You can look at their gift, and it tells you about the, the source of the gift. They had lost their focus. It wasn't just about what they were doing. It's part of the why and the how they were doing it that was the problem. God expects the best from us. God gives us his best. I mean, we just participate in remembering the fact that he sent his son. So, verses 6 to 10, forgetting the father. God's children had, had started to lose their focus on God and got lost in self and got lost in rituals, just going through the routine. You know, a vital relationship with God can easily slip into a, a weekly commitment, a seventh-day Christian rather than a seven-day follower of Christ. And when it slips into a weekly, it very easily moves from weekly to bi-weekly to monthly. And if it's just something that happens then at a monthly case, and I'm not talking about just attendance here. Hear me out. That would be actually the opposite of my point right now. It's not just, relationship with God is not just Sunday morning. I love getting together on Sunday morning. Believe me, I love it. But it can't be just this. It cannot be just this. And if it is just this, it is likely for you not only just being this. For many of us, it slips into just this. And we need to get back to talking to God more than just once a week. What kind of relationship would you have with your wife if you talked to her once a week? I won't even go there. That's coming up, that message. <laughs> Instead of looking forward to getting to the temple for worship, to spend time with God, they were looking forward to getting out of the temple and home. Wow. See what I mean about starting to sound a little bit too familiar? The ritual attendance become a, resulted in kind of a disgruntled type of giving. A, a giving that showed that they're not really there wholeheartedly. They were giving God leftovers. Now, I love leftovers. There are some foods that I almost would prefer cooked let to go room temperature, put in a fridge, and then eat. I and mean, there's some that just work as leftovers. I get that. But that's not it. They were, they were giving God kind of what was the scraps, the cutoffs, the discards, the things that you wouldn't even bring to the thrift store because they wouldn't take them, so you give them to the youth to do a fundraiser. Sorry, did I just say that? <laughs> I got a nice new couch, so I thought maybe the youth could use my old one. That's been a nest for everything in our house for the last 15 years. But, but no, you get the idea. I mean, they're giving God the leftovers. But not just because they were giving them the leftovers. It was they were reluctant worshipers. They were reluctant givers. They'd forgotten the place that God held in their heart. They weren't treasuring God the way they used to. 
in their new prosperity, they started to resent the fact that God actually had expectations for them, started to live substandard of it. God knew that they needed a better attention, a focus. And so the first thing he says after I love you is he says, I am your father. I'm your father. You're forgetting I am an almighty God. Snarky children. I love the word snarky. There are some words that just, you know, pop out at you. Snarky is one of them. Israel was good at claiming they were the children of God, but not really good at showing it or acting like it. I mean, they wanted the convenience, they wanted the blessing of being the children of God without the responsibility of family. They didn't want any chores. What a convenient relationship. Again, here is, is God sitting in his fatherly chair, inviting his children up on his lap, telling them he loves them, and then reminding them, I'm still your father. How do they respond? He guesses their response, almost like he's reading their mind. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? He says, by offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? You get this kind of almost argument. They're just like, boom, boom. It's like the tennis match argument. You know, they're just back and forth and back and forth. And then he said, and then he said, and then he said, and then he said. I'm your father. How have we defiled it? How have we not honored you? By defiling How have we not? He's not talking about relationship. I mean, he's, sorry, he's not talking about ritual. He's talking about relationship. He's, he's saying, listen, we've done it. We've checked the boxes. Offer sacrifices, we've done it. Attend, we're, we've done it. We've done this. Check that box. Check this box. We've done it. We're good. He said, no. Leviticus, back in, without going into much detail, but if you go back, there's a book in Leviticus and has God has a very, and if you wonder if God has expectations, God has expectations. He does. And expectations are good. Some of you are kind of the employees that would want to know what's expected of you. Because you want to know that whoever you're working for knows that you're giving your best. And you're meeting their expectations. Some of you want that feedback. How am I doing? Others of you say, I don't want anybody to have expectations of me. I want to set my own expectations. And you feel like squelched when you... But but the thing about worship is God has some expectations. And we're going to talk about that today. I'm not going to freak you out, but... Some of you are like, oh man, expectations. In Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 22 is expectations specifically in worship and he speaks to Aaron and his sons in Leviticus chapter 2, 2 and 19 to 20. Tell Aaron and his sons to treat with respect the sacred offerings the Israelites consecrate to me so they will not profane my holy name. I am the Lord. You must present a male without defect from the cattle, sheep, or goats in order that it may accept on your behalf. Do not bring anything with a defect because it will not be accepted on your behalf. God asked him to consider. Then, here in Malachi, you know that that sacrifice is not okay. He doesn't go into reminding them about Leviticus. He doesn't have to get in a big argument about what the rules are. He knows that they know what the rules are. I don't know why we do this as parents. We do it oftentimes. <clears throat> we, we think that when they break a rule, that it's because, it must be because they don't understand that that's a rule. But nine times out of ten, it's not information that's the problem. It's motivation. It's not that they don't know that that's the rule. It's that they don't want to follow the rule. And most discipline, if it's good, is motivation. Let me help you be motivated in following through and abiding by these rules. I mean, you know, you tell them, curfew's at 11. I told you it's 11. It's not quarter to 11. It's not, it's not 1030. Curfew's 11. I told you to be in by 11. What did I say the consequence would be? We remind them of all the information. They know it all. Nine times out of ten, it is not a lack of information. They just need to be motivated towards obedience. 
This problem, God doesn't give them all the big details, I said in my word. And later on, he deals with it a little bit, doesn't quote Leviticus. Here's what he says, though. He challenges them and says, okay, such a great offering you're giving. Try giving it to your governor and see how that works. Would they accept it? Or would they feel slighted? And if they would feel slighted, why, should I, why would God be okay? What am I doing wrong? See, it wasn't the what, it's the attitude. So, it's more on the how they're doing it. Moving on, and, and we're going to get, believe me, I'm ramping this up, it seems like a heavy right now, but I'm gonna, we're going to throw off the backpack of bricks and it's going to be much less burden at the end. Lame offering. It was hypocritical to expect God to give, give them his best when they weren't giving God their best. Why would we expect something less? Their resistance to honor God would not prevent God from being honored. God was going to be honored. It was hindering them. It was affecting them. They resisted God in giving their best, but they did care about image. See, they, they wanted to keep what they had, the best. It's not that God... See, I know some of you are probably trying to... It's hard to... You look at this and you think, what are we saying, that God only is going to accept... Uh, sacrifices from like rich people and people can afford to worship him is that what we're saying no actually quite the opposite actually see it's not equal giving it's equal sacrifice his issue was they weren't giving their best not that they were measuring best by everybody else's standards and later on he describes this he says the one guy right that has you have the means you've got it there you've got a best but you're choosing not to give what the other to forget the other guy you you had a better one but you chose to give this. That's the problem. Not, don't be measuring it by other people. It's not by other people. It's, it's just by an individual. He says, that guy's cheating. That guy's cheating. Making it look like he's following the rules, but he's not following the rules. See, the wealthy were holding the best for themselves and giving God the worst. That's the problem. You know, it makes me wonder. We come to the table. How can we justify giving God our worst, our sin, getting his best, forgiveness, mercy, and heaven, and peace, and joy? How do we justify that? How, we give him our worst, and we want his best. Now, the amazing thing is, that's the way it works, is we give him our sin, and he gives us his grace. And then all he says is, after that, you should recognize that, man, I got a good deal there. I mean, I got a really good deal there. So when in turn, he says, just, just give me from your first fruits. Just give me some best. Honor me with what you have out of what I've given you. And you recognize everything I have has come from it anyway. And when you take from what you have and everything you have is good because it came from him, and you say, I don't want to give you the best of what I have. I'll give you the worst. It really makes you wonder. See, if I said to you, I want you to give God all of your sin. You'd say, sure, I'll give it I'll give all of it. I'll give the shame, everything that goes with it, the guilt, everything. You just take it all, pack it all up, there you go. Good riddance. Then if I said to you, okay, I want to give him all your wealth. Well, see, that's the parable that we had of the rich young ruler, isn't it? Or time, or talent. God, give God your talent. All of a sudden, we start getting questions. Like, well, why? Well, what, 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 what do you want to do with it? Or what are your motives? Or what's the purpose? We all of a sudden have all these questions. God calls this guy a cheat. Why? Because he's got expectations. I don't want to go there too long, but because it's another whole text. But Cain and Abel, remember the very first argument. By the way, people have been arguing over worship since the beginning of time. Since the very first time, there are people saying, this is worship, this isn't worship. There's been fighting over worship from the very beginning. So we're never going to get rid of it. It's just going to be there always. I mean, unfortunately, that's what happens. But here it is, he's got God's expectations. 
and the expectations were clear. One, at, one met the expectations, one didn't meet the expectations. And what happened? Ironically, the one who met the expectations ended up dead because of the, the jealousy, the anger that was swelling up with the one who offered a substandard sacrifice. When you look at that story, you realize God has expectations. Why? Because he's a great God. And he does say to us, here is how I want you to worship. And so before I, and I'm not going to tell you, I want you to clap, I want you to dance, I want you to wave your arms, I want you, here's, it's not like that. It's not, it's not so much focused on the do's, even though in the Old Testament, they had a list of, of expectations of the way things were supposed to happen, but it was at its source, an attitude of the heart. And that's what Malachi is dealing with here. It's the background that was probably was, was a problem for God. The attitude. They were showing their disregard for God, their contempt for him by the sacrifices they were giving. How can we gladly receive from God and not gladly give? When God blesses you, it is for a reason. And it's not just for you. My kids love, uh, they're involved in hockey, minor hockey, and the one uh, problem with minor hockey is the concession stand. Because every time you go in an arena, Dad, can I have some money? Dad, can I get some poutine? <laughs> Dad, right? I mean, everything. Dad, you got any money? Now, I could be smart and just not have any money because you know those things don't take credit cards. So I'm all out. But you know what? I like, I understand it's part of the experience and uh, so, and I like snacks too. So um, generally what I do is I make sure before I go, I go, okay, I got the stick, got the hockey bag, okay, where's some cash? I need some toonies, I need a... A five dollar, some. I get some cash to make sure for the time. This is part of the whole experience for the kids, and and for me. Um, but so as I try to make my jacket fit, so the we get in there. Now here's what, and this is the drill. This is what happens. I don't go. Okay, here's here's, you know, a dollar for you, a dollar for you, a dollar. I don't do that. What I do is I usually, you know, get some money. I'll give them whatever I seem to have. It's like say five bucks. Say here's five bucks. I'll give it to him. Now, for a while, I had to give the expectation every time I gave the five bucks. But after a while, they know the drill. Imagine if I give the five bucks to one child, and out they go. and buy five dollars worth of candy and stuff their pockets, and they come out mouthful. And the other kids are going like, what, what, where's our money? Our kids know the drill. I'm giving the money to this one, and their job is to make sure you share with your brother and your sister. Yeah, I know. And even more than that, there's other kids there that are sitting there that have asked their parents for money, but they didn't bring any. They just brought credit cards. They've learned. Buy one for them, too. Get them a sour key. The sour keys are one of the favorites, you know, the big sour keys. Go and get some. So here's the thing. I'm giving to, to one child with an understanding and expectation that it's not just for that child. It's so that child can go, can enjoy the blessing not only of receiving a snack for themselves, but enjoy the blessing of being able to spread what I bless them with to bless others. I'm giving the opportunity for them to have the joy in giving by giving to the one and sharing. When God blesses you, it is not just for you to take to keep what's best and to get rid of what's worse. But it's so you can take, you will have what you need, you will be blessed, but you have an opportunity to also joy, have the joy of sharing and being a blessing. God will richly bless you so you can be generous on every occasion, as Paul says in Corinthians. We genuinely reflect the kind of joy we have in our heart when we share, when we bless. But if we keep and hoard and hold, we are revealing and betraying an attitude of the heart. 
It's not just Cain, it's not just Israel that struggled with this attitude. It has been a long-standing problem with God's people. And, and what can result with that is a separation relationship. And then if we have to continue to worship, even though our heart's not in the worship, we go through the motions to accomplish that. And it's the going through the motions that get us caught in this routine, separating us more and more from the genuine relationship that we intend to have in the beginning. We're okay with what Charles Swindoll calls $3 worth of God. Listen to his words. Some of us would love to buy $3 worth of God, not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not new birth. Whew. I want a pound of eternal in a paper sack. I want $3 worth of God, please. I want some penny candy. No. God is great. There's no piecing him out. I'll just have a snack on it. His God, is, God is great. And deserves our very best. Now, I know what you're asking me. See, I'm doing a little bit of Malachi argumenting here. So this is Malachi. You're saying, can't God, God's God. can he? He can use just a little boy's lunch and do a ma- fit all kinds of people. Yes, but do you notice he just didn't use part of that little boy's lunch? He used all of that little boy's lunch to feed thousands. I remember a Bible college teacher when we were, we were practicing singing and worshiping uh, a team when I was in Bible college. And why do we need to practice and why do we need to work and prepare? And he, he said something that m- marked for me a goal in, in ministry. Why I do what, we, what I do when I prepare every Sunday. He said to me, and on the team, he said, God can, can use half a cup if we only have half a cup to give. God can do amazing things with a half. God can do amazing things with an empty cup. But the question is, why would we give God an empty cup to use when we can give him a full cup? Boy, man, that got me. Of course, I'm in, I'm in Bible college, so I'm already reflecting on anything any, every, all the time anyway. But I never forgot I remember that day committing to say, God, I will give you a full cup. I will give you my best. And if that's not enough, well, God, you're going to have to make it, make it last and make it work. But I'll give you my all, best I can do. Ability to give God good sacrifices. It wasn't on the ability for the, those who are able to give great sacrifices would have an opportunity for great worship. And those that have less means, it's actually quite the contrary. It's the same way when Jesus would look at the widow giving a mite and saying, she's given more than all of you because she's giving it all. It's getting across the point. It's like God saying, you would never give the gifts you're giving to people you love. So why are you giving them to me? Now, up until now, and we're at the end now of Malachi chapter 1, first one's already done. We've only got three more chapters left. And it thinks the story's over here, but it's really not over. We're going to finish and then, and, and then uh, conclude the service with some praise. The priests up, and down now, up until now, they're probably shouting, Amen. Give it to them, God. After all, the priests would get some of their sustenance from the sacrifice that was being brought in. from the, they, they were eating out of these, these sick and lame animals that were coming in for sacrifices. And so they're probably saying, good, finally we're going to get some good prime beef coming in now rather than this kind of junk. End of chapter 1, you think that's the end of the discussion. That's not it. In the middle of their amens and the priests, let them have it, God. God turns to the priests and goes, and you, uh uh-oh, directs his pleasure to those who failed to correct this thing. How did you let this get so far down the road the wrong way? The spiritual leaders should have addressed the problem before now, and they didn't. They were too worried about their own popularity. They were too worried about who they would be and honoring their name and keeping the status quo and not upsetting things, not rocking the boat, worried more about themselves and the way things are than worrying about God's honor. They would sniff contemptuously, 
full of resentment out of what they would get, but still not upset enough to do anything about it. God is not happy with these guys. Calls them aside and speaks to his leaders. They didn't like what they got, but they didn't want to lose everything. They were more concerned with themselves than about God. They were cowards. They were more concerned about their own image than the Creator. It's a mirror of the last days when people will teach to itching ears. God's covenant included giving His best, and what they were giving was short. I give my best. All I say is in response is you commit 100% to me. We were at a wedding yesterday. One standing at the altar saying, I give you my life. The other one saying, I give you all of me. Can you imagine what kind of a wedding it would have been? I give you all of me. Well, I give you some of me. I give you a little bit of my time. And that just doesn't work in that covenant relationship of marriage. And why would it and how would it work in our relationship with God? It does not work. It's not because he's being a mean or an ogre. He just knows that it's not going to be a good, it's not going to work. It's a covenant. I am all in and you're all in. That's what makes it work. They were more than just cowardly. They were corrupt. If you flip over and you're reading those chapter, chapter 2, the first few verses, you'll see as you move down to verse 7 to verse 9, They had great influence, and unfortunately, their influence did not bring about transformation, but moral corruption and compromise. Actually, the word used is violated the covenant. It means to corrupt morally. It's more than just you broke the law. It has with it a a corporate meaning. It means that you broke the law, and others followed you. It's speaking to the older brother or sister and said, listen, you disobeyed, and because you disobeyed, your little brother and sister followed you. You violated the law. More than just the fact that now you're guilty, you're guilty, and others are guilty with you. And he's speaking to the leaders that should have known better. I'm giving a lot of parental kind of explanations this morning as far as uh, as illustrations. See, the role of the priest is not to be popular with people, but to be popular and care what God thinks. Stand in the gap, speak the truth. In fact, historically, if you look back to Levite, now, just to kind of explain, we did this in staff. In the Old Testament, all priests are Levites. They had to come from the tribe of Levi. And have their lineage traced back to them. But not all Levites are priests. Not everybody in that tribe was automatically a priest. Right? So it had to be, you know, for instance, all monarchy in England are British. But unfortunately for Pastor Call, not all people with British heritage are monarchy. King Call. You get it? So if you're a Levite, That doesn't make you automatically a priest. But if you're a priest, you will for sure be a Levite. Now, way back in, the reason why this happened with this, and this this covenant with Levi and his descendants, was because way back, Levi stood up, took a stand, spoke up for God, and stood in the gap. And he says, that's the guy I'm going to have, and his generations are going to do the same thing that he just did from generation to generation. They're going to stand up, they're going to speak the truth, they're going to stand in the gap. Make a stand. And here are these people who are where they are because their great, 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 whatever grandfather, the Levi, the one whose name they now still hold, stood in the gap, spoke the truth, took a stand. And here they are, cowardly, corrupt, and putting up with sin. Hmm. Things have gone a long way wrong. And God was going to try to correct it. Get them focused back on truth. Ironically, they were trying to do this because people liked them, and in the end, they despised them anyway. Well, there's a truth in there. So moving towards the end, what was he going to do? Well, I need to get he needed to get their focus back on on God. I know you're thinking, Pastor, that's not a very encouraging sermon. But I'm getting there. I'm going to really try. So, okay, this is how we'll close. Nothing more encouraging than focusing on God and glorifying God. So that's how we're going to end. Generally, you know, when you come to worship service, this is the way it's going to be. And, and the problem is when things happen the way they always happen again and again, it, it tends and lends to going through the motions. 
And nothing could be worse for a relationship than going through the motions. Marriage, family, friendship, or spiritually. And so, yeah, today, some of you are like, what? They're already doing communion? We just got here. Oh, they man, they're changing everything up. People are coming and going. This is not the way we do it. There's a real good book about change. If you've never read it, it's, it's a, actually a secular book, but I believe God uh, used some God wisdom in it. And it's uh, Who Moved My Cheese. Anybody read that book, Who Moved My Cheese? Read that book? It's a great book. It talks about change. So if you never change, you do things the same way all the time. The problem is, eventually, sometimes that cheese is gone. And when it is, everything goes crazy. So what they found out, the, cheese, the, the, the mice wouldn't go crazy if they just always were moving the cheese. Then the mice would go where it was last, and if it wasn't there, they'd look and see where it is now. And then you start to train the mice to actually realize they're not just so stuck on just going to the same place every time. They develop a capacity to say, hey, if it's not there, that's fine. It's somewhere around here. I'll find it. And I think sometimes spiritually we get so used to saying, well, I meet with God when we do this. We do two hymns. We do fast. We do slow. We do uh, the songs. And we play this one in the key of F. I play the key of F. It's the key of F that's the one. We do it this way, and when the pastor's there, and at the end, when he says this, then I do that, and then, oh, I feel God. And it's got to happen that way then. We've got to do it over and over and over again. We've got to feel God. We've got to do it the same way. Oh, no. What's going to happen? No. I don't have that worship leader. We don't have that song. Or The key of F is broken. What are we going to do? And everything goes crazy. Everything goes sideways. Rather than saying, listen, I don't care. Take away the keyboard. Take away the sound system. Pastor Jamie's got laryngitis. But you know what? I'm going to find a way to worship my God today. See, that's the difference. You see, that's, it's, it's a focusing not on what we're doing and how we're doing it, but saying whether we do it upside down, backwards, forwards, preach first, no announcement, offering twice. Well, there'd be one, man. That'd be a good one, offering twice. But <laughs> we're not doing that today. But... Switch it around all you want. You're coming on a Sunday saying, Bleh! it could be dark, there could be smoke, it could be bright, it could be loud, it could be quiet. It doesn't matter. I'm going to find a way to worship God today because he is great. That's what it is going to be about. See, that's different. And I know, and I, listen, I get it. I'm not trying to tick you off and make it hard to worship. We're not trying to say, trip you up and say, okay, yeah, you think you're going to worship today? Well, I'm going to make it hard for you. And that's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to make, you know, Make you pull your hair out and say, my goodness, they're making it so hard for me to worship today. That's not what we're trying to do. If I can do whatever I can to, to facilitate worship, that's what we're trying to do. But in the process, if it's different or something, that's not the worst of things. You see, it's all about glorifying God. I didn't have any of that in my notes. I just went right off script. See, why are you coming to church then? Why are you coming to church? You come to church to glorify God together. That is it. There's, it. There's some byproducts of that. You see some friends, you join, you connect. That's great. It's important to connect with us, but it is all about God. That is it. I hope you do not come to be entertained. I hope that at the end you can ask yourself this. Did I meet with God and grow in appreciation of his greatness today? We are not here to entertain you. We are here to assist you. We are not here to worship for you. We are not here to worship you. We are not here for you to worship us. We are here to worship with you. The people who are up here are playing. I know their hearts, every one of them. And don't dare judge them by just what you see. I know their heart for God. And I know their heart to have you worship God. And I know they're here to worship with you when they worship. They're not just doing up here. And you know what? It's some of the sweetest sounds is when you can hear the congregation. One of the things that marks this congregation is that when we sing and there is music and you can hear a sound system that's amplified with things like this and this, but you can actually hear and you cannot drown out the amplification of you guys worshiping. You can hear that. You can even hear it on the, on the recordings as you record it. And then you guys aren't even mic'd. You can hear it. You can hear it. Because we're worshiping together. We are not the audience. You are not the audience. God is the audience. And he is great. And because he's great, he deserves our best. <laughs> Ask yourself, did I meet with God today? give God your best. And I know, and I'm getting there really, but I believe that we can even, and you are great, you are, you are exuberant, you're expressive church when you, when you worship. But I still think we can do even better. 
Are you giving God your best time and with your talents and your treasures? Not just what's left. Uh, today's a big event, Super Bowl coming up. I think it's going to be the Broncos. But uh, yeah, see, so I know. So, but uh, I do enjoy watching. I enjoy competition. I enjoy watching competition, especially at a high level. Listen to what NFL football player uh, said. John Burrow played for the Falcons in the 33rd Super Bowl. Here's what he said. In the middle of all the explosions and the hoopla and the hype, all I could think was, is this it? Is this all it is? This doesn't even compare to worshiping my God. See, it comes down to this. Since God is great, give him your best. So how are we going to do that practically? And then I'm going to call a team. Just a minute, I'm going to call a team. So they're getting ready. Tie your shoes. Give God priority over possessions. You see, this is one of the root causes things. By giving God less, keeping the best, what they were saying was, we are giving what we have priority over God. See, it wasn't that they were just accepting and giving God their second best. You see, it wasn't, they weren't just giving him, you know, close to the best. They were giving them the worst. It had turned and had gone so far now, and it probably started with second best, third best, fourth best, fifth best, but now they were giving the lame sacrifices. It had gone a long ways away from where it should be. God deserves priority over your possessions. He blesses you. But as the one song used to be sing a number of years ago, seek the giver, not the gift. They thought God didn't care what they did. They were middle class people who worked hard, had high bills, high taxes, high expectations, demands, with not a lot of extra. But God had given them everything he had anyway. Give God priority over your possessions. Number two, Grasp the greatness of God. Verse 10. This verse 10 literally caused me to drop my Bible on my desk when I read it. It should shake you in the boots. Listen to what he says. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I read that, I thought, wow. Wow. I am not pleased with you. I'm thinking, no kidding. Here's what he's saying. He goes, if that's the case, then shut the doors. Pack it up. We're out of here. Because if we can't make this about the way it should be, and if it's just going to be going through the motions, and if it's going to be some kind of false thing, then forget it. It is not what I signed up for. It's not the way it needs to be, because it will not be what it's pretending to be. Shut the doors. Lock them up. I pray that someone wouldn't even let anybody come in and offer any sacrifice at all. I'd rather have no sacrifice than this sacrifice. That is, I'm like, whoa, shut it down. God does not need our sacrifices. He's saying, don't you dare allow me to be represented in some lifeless religious icon. You can't play church. You can't play a relationship with God. I know this stings. So why give? Here's the purpose. Verse 11. Here's why God's playing such a hard line. Shut the door. Why? Because here's it. Verse 11. My name will be great among the nations from the rising of the setting of the sun. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to my name because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Do you see the pattern? There's a cadence there. There's something there that is, every time God mentions sacrifice, he says, I will be great, I am to be feared. Every time. Sacrifice and worship is linked to the greatness of God. When we give him our best, we are grasping the greatness of God. On the other hand, when we give him our least, we are saying that God doesn't matter that much. It's really quite simple. When we fail to celebrate God's greatness, we're giving him our best. Our priorities get out of whack. 
We become bored with God and distracted by other things. I have the worship team come up. Instead of counting it a privilege to minister on God's behalf, they were counting it a burden. Puffing, they said, sniffing contemptuously. It's literally what he's trying to do. It's a great sniffing contemptuously. It's like, like, you know, those spoiled brat kind of response. If we get a glimpse of the greatness of God, what Christ has done for us, I don't think we can play church. I don't think we can fake it. If we really could appreciate what God has done for us, what he's doing for us, what he has in store for us, we would give him our best for the rest of our life. A relationship with God that has minimal sacrifice will have minimal joy. The fewer the investments, the fewer the dividends. And listen to the way this text ended. It ended describing God not just as almighty, but as a king. True or false, faith, we serve, we belong to a great king. Our king is a great king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the greatest of kings. There's no king like our king. He is a benevolent, awesome king. This king got off his throne and came down to this earth, humbled himself so that we once again could be in his presence. Our king gave us salvation. Our king gave us the cross. Our king gave us grace. Our king gives us eternal life. Our king gives us resurrection eternal life. Our king gave us the Holy Spirit so we would have his presence with us always leading and guiding us back into his presence for an eternity. Our king has a mission, not only that we would be in his presence, but that his family would grow, that others would go with us, that we would not take people away from our king, but we would bring people into his kingdom so they can enjoy of his presence and his gifts and his blessings. He has shared with us so we can share with others the joy of being a part of the family of God. Our king is a great king. Our God is a great God, and he deserves our best. Would you stand with me? Would you worship him? And worship him with your best this morning. Yes.